Welcome to the third edition of our joint roundtable with the Dhaka Tribune on the Belt and Road Initiative Connecting the World. My name is Shubham and I'll be your Master of Ceremonies for today. I'm a part, a part of the research team at the organization and it is my absolute honor to welcome you all to this topic of discussion. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the mic to our respected moderators. Major General Menur Zaman, President, Sir of the Bangladesh Institute of President, Peace and Security Studies, and Mr. Zafar Sohan, editor of the Dhaka Tribune. President, Sir, over to you. Thank you, Shubham. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you here this afternoon. This is a series of discussion, dialogues, and roundtables that we conduct with the Dhaka Tribune on issues of national and international importance. And today we are talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. Needless to say that this is one of the significant strategies in the world today and will shape the course of current history over the coming years and decades. It touches countries all around the world. Therefore, it has a significance of global significance. To talk about these issues, we have two panelists today, and they are Dr. Fahmy, the, the Executive Director of CPD, the premier economic think tank in Bangladesh, and Pravesh Karim Babasi from the Department of Economics of East West University a noted scholar and an academician. Unfortunately, our third speaker or panelist, Brigadier Shahidul Anam Khan, had to be hospitalized for an urgent operation and is unable to be here today. But he sends his regrets and we all pray for his early recovery. With that very brief introduction, I will now hand it over to Zafar. Mr. Zafar Sivan is a uh, co-host of this function today, and is the editor of the Dhaka Tribune. Zafar, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, General. And I would like to reiterate your thanks and appreciation to all those who have taken the time to be here with us this afternoon. This is the third edition of what I think is a very meaningful series of dialogues, which uh, Dhaka Tribune and BIPs have been putting together. Uh, we started uh, about a month and a half ago and we hope this is gonna be a continuing series. Our last um, two dialogues, the first one was on AUKUS and the Quad, and the second one was on the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, which is just uh, a few weeks ago. I feel that talking about the Belt and Road Initiative as we are today is in a sense long overdue because uh, the general has alluded to the fact that this initiative is going to be one which is going to help shape the geopolitical world order over the coming decades and especially in this part of the world. And I feel that it's really a subject uh, and the implications of which are under discussed, certainly here in Bangladesh. And as we talk about Bangladesh's place in the world, as we talk about the challenges which and in the opportunities that are gonna unfold over the coming years, I think it's absolutely incumbent upon us to really start to look at the world as it exists and the forces that are shaping the world um, in its current um, incarnation. So uh, without further ado, I'm very keen to hear what our two uh, speakers have to say. And of course, our format is such that once the speakers have finished speaking, we do um, encourage and invite all of you to have your say, because what makes these dialogues so meaningful and worthwhile is, of course, the input and um, participation of all of you, as well as our esteemed speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zafar. And before I go to our panelists, I have some brief comments to make on the subject and perhaps introduce the subject to you to lay the ground for discussion. The Belt and Road, the concept, the Belt and Road Initiative concept or BRI concept 
was first given by President Xi Jinping during his visit to Kazakhstan in 2013. He further explained the concept of BRI during his address in Jakarta the next year. The belt, which is essentially the reincarnation of the old Silk Road, came first. And then in 2014, President Xi Jinping outlined the plan for the road. Interesting for all of us, the road is the maritime route, as we understand that, and the belt is the land road or the land routes. So it's a combination of connectivity by land and connectivity by sea or the maritime routes. So far, according to official statistics that we have researched, 142 countries have signed on to BRI. There are 42 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, 34 BRI countries in Europe and Central Asia, 24 BRI countries in East Asia and the Pacific, 17 BRI countries in the Middle East in North Africa, 19 BRI countries in the Latin America and the Caribbean, and seven countries in South Asia. So it literally covers the entire world. Its expansion has touched all continents and it has covered most of the countries in many parts of the world. There are also 66 international organizations that are connected to BRI and they come from various financial institutions to construction institutions and they're of different nature. The total cost estimate of the vision of BRI is estimated to be $4 trillion. It's massive and it's mega. The World Bank estimates that by 2018, $600 billion has already been spent on BRI project. And the funding which has been, which has slowed down due to the pandemic for the last two years is again picking up with the pace of disbursement over $100 billion a year and accelerating. BRI also takes up a lot of mega construction and infrastructure projects all around the world. I will only name a few, for example. In Bangladesh, we have the Padda Rail Link project as part of BRI. We have Central Asia China gas pipeline. Then there is Doria multipurpose port in Djibouti. Mombasa Nairobi Standard Gauge Railway in Kenya, the Malacca Gateway in Malaysia, the Belgrade Montenegro Bar Port in Serbia, and various other very large infrastructure and mega projects all around the world. But what is essentially BRI is the lifeline of the corridors. The BRI essentially rests on six economic corridors. Four of the corridors are land corridors and two corridors have maritime access. So whatever we talk about BRI, the very lifeline of BRI is the six economic corridors. The first corridor is the new Eurasian land bridge economic corridor. The second corridor is China-Mongolia-Russia economic corridor. The third corridor is China-Central Asia-West Asia economic corridor. 
The fourth one is China in the China Peninsula Economic Corridor. The fifth one to which we belong is the BCIM EC or Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar Economic Corridor. And the sixth one is China Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPEC. The last two corridors that I just mentioned are the two maritime corridors because they both end up with maritime access. The BCIM corridor to which Bangladesh will belong ends up in the Indian Ocean with having access to two entry points, one through Myanmar in the Rakhine province in Chakpu port and one through Chittagong in Bangladesh. It then ends up in Kolkata in India. Unfortunately, this corridor has not yet been implemented. So the Chinese authorities have now taken the decision to implement CIMAC China Myanmar Economic Corridor, which has been implemented. The rest of the two countries are yet to be connected, which is Bangladesh and then eventually India, if the whole BCIM corridor is to be linked. With this corridor, Bangladesh is also then gets land linked to China, which completely changes the geostrategic architecture of the region. Land connectivity also provides Bangladesh with access to a large market through land corridor, and it also adds a tremendous significant strategic depth to the country. There are several projects in Bangladesh that have now been initiated and I will name some of them. Bangladesh is a signatory country of BRI. It signed on to BRI in 2016 during the visit of President Xi Jinping to Bangladesh. During that signature of BRI in Dhaka, the Chinese government pledged 26 billion USD to Bangladesh for infrastructural development and it further promised $14 billion in investment. So a total package of 40 billion US dollar has now been promised or planned under the BRI project of Bangladesh as a signatory country. Some of the projects that have now been initiated in Bangladesh costing over $12 billion is the Further Bridge Rail Link, which is worth about $4 billion. The Pyra Power Plant, worth about $2 billion. The Digital Connectivity Infrastructure in Bangladesh, worth $1 billion. And the Power Grid Network Strengthening Project, worth about roughly $2 billion. Besides this, there are several other initiatives that are in the pipeline and are being financed under the BRI projects. The BRI is not only about now connectivity by land and the sea routes. BRI has now expanded to other concepts and areas. The first is the digital Silk Road through which China and BRI wants to connect its member countries and the rest of the world digitally. And that is also a mega concept and a mega project, which will transcend beyond physical connectivity and it will go into virtual connectivity. BRI has also now expanded its concept to the Polar Silk Road, which will connect the poles and that is also something that will dramatically expand the horizons of BRI and completely transcend into a new world of geostrategy. 
the concept of BRI is still evolving. And therefore, we have to watch it very carefully all the time to see what new ideas and what new concepts are coming into the BRI concept. But during the summit of BRI in Beijing two years back, just before the COVID hit the world, President Xi Jinping, during an address to the summit, did come out with a lot of issues of concern and hopes. He categorically mentioned that all BRI projects have to be financially viable, thereby addressing the concern about the so-called or the concept of debt traps. He also mentioned that all BI projects in future needs it to be environmentally sustainable, addressing the questions of all environmental concerns in BRI projects around the world. The other highlights of the summit, which laid a new direction to BRI, I will just mention a few here so that you can understand that BRI is not only about physical connectivity or virtual connectivity, it is also looking at connectivity at all other different planes and other areas of connectivity. So he talked about the alliance of international science organizations of BRI, because BRI today lays a lot of importance on science and technology. He talked about Beijing Initiative for Clean Silk Road, which is essentially environmental issues. There is now a Belt and Road Energy Partnership because BRI also wants to bring a BRI energy grid eventually. So the partnership is growing. There is also the, the Belt and Road News Alliance which is bringing together major newspapers and news portals and news agencies together under the umbrella of BRI. There is also the Belt and Road Studies Network, which is a network of leading think tanks in all BRI countries. He talked about the Digital Silk Road Initiative talked about the principles of financing, development of the Belt and Road, bringing the good practices that has to be followed in all BRI projects. He talked about the International Academy, which is being set up under the BRI umbrella called the BRI Science Academy. He also talked about international coalition of green development on the Belt and Road Initiative Pathways. So it is a comprehensive vision now, which is going way beyond the initial concepts of connectivity and infrastructure. There is now also talk about harmonization of customs and regulations in each country under BRI. So eventually, they're also moving in the harmonization in the financial field. So BRI today is looking way beyond its initial concepts and going into areas where it had not initially touched. But then it also brings in a lot of concerns. The concerns are being expressed by its member countries and non-member countries. One of the major concerns is that other debts being offered by China, are they sustainable? Or are countries getting into debt traps for which eventually they are unable to cope with it financially and in some cases have to manage this, but what has been called sovereignty swap in certain particular areas. And the example that has been often cited 
is the humble thought of port in, in Sri Lanka. But this is also under study and analysis now, and I'm sure the audience here will have a lot to say about these issues. The second concern that is coming to our mind is that are they environmentally clean and sustainable? Because it has broken through areas where there are sensitive environmental spaces, certainly in Central Asia and other parts of Africa, where several concerns have been raised by member countries about its environmental future. So that is an area that has to be looked into. BRI has also unfortunately been linked to a lot of corruption cases in many countries, for which during the summit, President Xi Jinping also did very clearly point out that all projects have to be clean and they have to be transparent. So BRI cannot be linked to any corruption cases in any part of the world, and that's an area of concern. There is issues of strategic concern and security that has been raised now, whether there are drill tech approaches to certain projects, whether certain projects or mega projects that have been taken, they have security in the background, particularly the issues of the concept of dual use of some ports and civilian port that has the capacity for being used as a naval port for security purposes. So that's an issue that has been raised. An issue that has also been raised is that, is BRI going to go into a strategic competition, eventually strategic tension, and even conflict with the concept of Indo-Pacific strategy? And that is raising a lot of concern in many countries. So I lay this before you so that you see the good side of BRI and you also see what are the issues of concern that has been raised so far in many areas of the world, in many countries, member countries, non-member countries, so that when we discuss, we evaluate them objectively with all its connotations, the benefits and the pitfalls. But the fact remains that it is a mega concept, it is a grand strategy, that is here to stay and as i said at the beginning it will shape the future of strategy in our world for the coming years and decades with that i will now invite our first panelist dr farmida to speak and give her comments and opinion dr farmida you have the floor thank you chair um, thank you Dhaka tribune and Bips, for inviting me to this uh, roundtable discussion uh, indeed, uh, General Munizaman has already laid out uh, the whole landscape of BRI, starting from its initiation to um, its, uh, its um, investment in various cases, not only in um, physical infrastructure, but also in case of soft infrastructure. And also, he has laid down where are the areas um, under which BRI is um, supporting in case of Bangladesh and also uh, all over the world. I think there is very little uh, left for me to talk because you have covered such a wide range of issues, um, all the issues which are related to BRI. So starting from uh, investment in various sectors and also the challenges. So I would just, you know, summarize, maybe repeat some of the issues that you have already uh, discussed and mentioned. Um, so, uh, as we know that BRI's major, you know, one of the major objectives is to invest in infrastructure. And, um, and BRI's some of the major areas like infrastructure, trade, uh, cultural areas, and also financial integration. So these are very important also for Bangladesh because Bangladesh is an, um, is an emerging economy. Its uh, in demand for investment is very high. 
and um, so Bangladesh is one of the you know signatory of uh, one of the member countries of BRI, as we have heard from uh, General Munisaman. So I would like to just go straight into some of the facts and numbers of why BRI is important in case of Bangladesh. First, to start with the infrastructure. So the uh, infrastructure gap in Bangladesh, we know that it's huge. Um, <clears throat> first, you know, if we look at the physical infrastructure, because um, it is now um, in the you know, graduating from a least developed country to a developing country, and it has already graduated transition from a, a low income country to a um, lower middle income countries. And also, Bangladesh itself is investing on uh, infrastructure hugely which requires um, a lot of uh, resources, financial resources. As a country um, develops, gradually the need for infrastructure resources um, goes down. But at this moment, if we look at the numbers, the difference between the infrastructure investment needs and the current trends of infrastructure investment in Bangladesh is, um, you know, is um, predicted to be, is about you know, 1%. We always if you look at, I mean, if we had uh, had an opportunity to show a graph that if we look at the demand or needs and what we are getting, there's a huge, huge gap. And in terms of uh, sector-wise infrastructure gap, we um, uh, we would be able to see that when we see a sectoral decomposition of infrastructure investment, uh, there is a huge gap in case of. Um, also, the need is in case of energy and transport sector. And there are estimations that by 2040, infrastructure investment needs of the energy and transport sectors will be about 1.5%. And uh, also, it will be 1.1% 1 .1 for that is 1.5% for the energy um, and 1% of GDP or for the transport sectors by 2040. So we will need a flow of investment resources uh, for the years, for the coming years. Um, and how BRI can uh, fill up the gaps, we have heard a number of uh, investments where uh, the um, investments are being made under the BRI. And the, in Bangladesh also, the largest proportion of BRI projects are in energy sector and also transport sector. Uh, so. Uh, from that point of view, BRI is, you know, supporting or meeting the gaps in the energy and transport sector. Um, if we look at the trade uh, issues, trade areas, export and import, China traditionally has been one of the largest trade partners of Bangladesh. But um, the, the scenario of export and import, as you know, that it, that's different. Um, over the past 10 years, if we see that um, China had, uh, had, in case of exports from Bangladesh to China, um, China had not been one of the traditional markets for Bangladeshi exports. So it was um, in as of uh, 2019, we don't have the later, uh, latest data, uh, China was in the 10th position in case of Bangladesh's export de destination. But on the other hand, if you look at the import, um, so, in case of import, it is the, uh, the largest or the biggest import partner of Bangladesh. It has overtaken um, India um, since uh, last 10 years or so. So, um, in 2018, the, uh, China was the largest trading partner of Bangladesh with a share of about 19% of total trade of Bangladesh, so which is huge. Uh, say for a single country, um, about 19% of the total trade uh, Bangladesh does with uh, China. So this was almost double the amount of trade with India and more than trade with USA and G Germany combined. Um, so we can see that um, the volume of trade, and it is increasing, uh, in fact, so over the years. Uh, in case of investment, which is another pillar of BRI, in, in, in so foreign investment, um, we have seen that um, in Bangladesh there is a there has been a record high net foreign investment inflow in 
2020, um, in fact, in the month of July to March in 2019. So that, that was driven by mainly Chinese investment. And in fact, from uh, January to March 2019, Chinese net foreign direct investment inflow was um, about 38% of total FDI inflow to Bangladesh um, during that period, that is from January to March 2019. And we also had seen that financial integration has also been happening in April 2018. Alipay, a concern of China's e-commerce and tech giant Alibaba Group, they had bought 20% stakes in Bcash, which is Bangladesh's largest mobile financial service provider. Um, in case of uh, other Chinese investment, uh, so China's investment in BRI projects, that has usually been in the range of $100 million to USD $1 billion. Um, and um, in case of the other part, the, that is the cultural or people-to-people -people, um, connectivity or cultural aspects, which is another pillar of BRI, uh, there has been al has also a shift or increasing trend in terms of Chinese scholarships to uh, Bangladeshi students, not only in Bangladesh, but all over the world there has been a jump in uh, Chinese government scholarships offered to foreign students. And um, also, not only um, you know, uh, taking students to uh, China, but also um, language training, um, also and uh, Chinese cultural centers that those have also increased. So there are um, we can see that there are efforts towards um, and uh, towards a comprehensive partnership, as uh, Major General Murisaman has mentioned that the partnership. In this day and age, partnership cannot happen in isolation or not in a, or in a piecemeal basis. It has to be comprehensive uh, in through trade, through investment, through um, education. Uh, so, it, BRI is an example um, of this comprehensive uh, partnership. Uh, the concerns, of course, a uh, lot of promises are there because this is a source of um, China has become one of the important sources of uh, support, financial support, definitely. Uh, and at, in this day and age, we see that the global resources are either drying or are being diverted to other priority areas. There are you know, wars, there are natural disasters, there are um, radicalism. So, migration issues, so resources are being deployed um, to other areas which are a priority of, of the other uh, traditional uh, developed countries. So South-South cooperation has become an important source for, uh, for the developing countries and also for the least developed countries. So we have seen um, how China has been traditionally um, investing in African countries, so their focus has now shifted to other emerging economies. So Bangladesh has been a part of this uh, initiative. But the concerns which have been raised, the dead concern, dead issue, uh, which is an issue, but uh, there are also examples that China is now trying to uh, reduce the burden of debt in many countries. They have, uh, in fact, they have, um, uh, they have uh, taken away or um, reduce the burden in many ways uh, so that the countries don't have to pay pay back their um, you know, loans and debts. In case of Bangladesh, we are still in a comfortable situation in terms of debt GDP ratio, but a caution has to be taken uh, because the example, uh, example of Sri Lanka had come up. The other issue is the environmental concern because the we have seen that most of the investments are in energy and transport. And in case of energy, we are seeing that there are investment in coal, um, also uh, investment through coal energy. So coal is the dirtiest uh, energy, which is the source, uh, important source of carbon emission. Um, and this is uh, not very encouraging uh, because we have also seen that China is one of the important 
sources of renewable energy. In fact, it has invested heavily on renewable energy. Um, already in uh, 2017, there's the uh, investment of, of equivalent to 8 billion for solar goods uh, in China. And in fact, it has, by investing higher amount in renewable energy, China has surpassed the top, uh, you know, top country, which is, uh, which is top in terms of investing in renewable energy, that is Germany. So, but it is, it is slightly uh, not very encouraging to see that uh, our, we are having investment uh, through you know, coal energy. This is, uh, this is also not, uh, uh, not very compatible um, with the concept of President Xi, Xi Jinping, who has introduced the concept of ecological civilization. Uh, which actually ta uh, takes care of uh, the environmental governance issues. And also we heard about the uh, issue of um, green uh, financing system, uh, the green one belt and one road, which is a commitment of China's um, Chinese government uh, towards the ecological security and sustainable development. So um, this is one of the important concerns. The other concern is also regarding the social aspect, because when there are huge infrastructures, uh, roads and railways, uh, that requires land uh, you know, um, claim. So many um, households or villages, they are to be evicted. Um, so that is an issue, very sensitive issue, because people don't usually, even if you compensate adequately, they don't want to, you know, move out of their um, homes, which are where they are rooted. So uh, that aspect has to be also um, handled very carefully. The other issue has also been mentioned regarding the governance issue. In fact, the uh, lack of open, transparent, and competitive procurement process uh, that it has been raised by many um, in case of many projects. And because of this practice, it can lead to poor performance of the project itself because one doesn't really know that how much investment has been made in what components and how that investment and who uh, participated in the tendering process, uh, how transparent it has been. So that is, that these are the issues which are preconditioned for an effective and, uh, and successful implementation of projects. In fact, because of due to lack of transparency, um, there are financial risks and benefits. And also, uh, World Bank, this um, uh, World Bank does this uh, indicator, which is Corruption Perception Index. So it has been shown that projects which are under belt and road corridor economies, so they, those have a bit, um, you know, those have higher um, CPI score compared to other projects. So this is a um, concern. Uh, and particularly when projects are implemented in countries which are poor countries, least developed countries, even developing countries where governance is already an issue. So when uh, those projects are implemented in a non-transparent manner, then it creates all the more difficulties and also uh, the efficiency of resource utilization is under question. Um, the issue of you know, environmental uh, aspects has been mentioned and the clean sil silk road. So one only hope that, hopes that um, the uh, promises regarding the green BRI and sustainable BRI, which have been promised at the second BRI uh, forum, second Belton Road Forum, there uh, these promises have been made by Chinese authority. So to move forward, uh, there is no denying that Bangladesh needs huge investment in many areas, including uh, physical infrastructure and also soft infrastructure. And particularly when we are graduating and also when we are committed to implement the sustainable development goals, when we are um, struggling uh, or trying to recover from the fallout of COVID-19, uh, which had really impacted the economy and the social indicators uh, hugely.
and in fact many of the achievements of not only bangladesh but many countries that those have been reversed so in order to bring back those reverse then the reversal which has happened in terms of you know um, education in terms of economic uh, progress uh, in terms of women's empowerment in terms of accessibility to technology so those have to be reversed back and in doing so in that effort uh, chinese um, support chinese financial support chinese knowledge support can really help um, for recovering the economy and also uh, the other aspects the most important i would you know um re-emphasize once again that the environmental aspect of the investment so it is not only in china but many other developed many developed countries are also when they invest even in bangladesh i wouldn't you know refer to you here this is not the forum but they are also investing in coal uh coal energy they are not doing away with coal energy and this is when we have just uh, seen uh, the com um, completion of COP26, when countries have, have committed to towards net zero, uh, China has also made commitment by 2060 it will be a um, carbon neutral uh, economy. So, while China goes through that journey, I think some of the experiences can also be um, uh, trans you know transmitted and uh, used in case of Bangladesh. So, um, and for Bangladesh also itself, uh, it has to prepare itself that not only Chinese investment, but for any investment, whether these investments, uh, what is the cost benefit, uh, how the resources are utilized, because in most cases we see that uh, our projects are uh, become, are most cost, more costly than the original cost, the cost escalation. Uh, then uh, time uh, run, uh, time overrun. Uh, these are the issues which are associated with our uh, projects. So, uh, in case of larger projects, this is all the more important because the the cost overrun is so huge that you know at the end of the day, uh, one has to. In fact, the common people we have to pay for it. Uh, when, for example, when uh, a road is constructed, when the tolls are set, the tolls uh, or fees and charges will be set according to the cost. Uh, so if the cost goes, it directly affects the people. It may facilitate the transportation, facilitate, facilitate communication, but the cost uh, will be also inflicted on the common uh, citizens. So that has to be kept in mind. So we have to also prepare ourselves. It is not only the countries which have investment here, but if we are also efficient, if we are transparent, if we have an accountability system, and we also, if we have also skilled human resources, then we'll be able to utilize the benefits which are offered under BRI. Thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive outlook of BRI particularly from the economic and trade point of view and other issues. Uh, BRI lays a lot of emphasis on its historic roots. The ancient Silk Road was the convergent point for many different faiths and cultures. So therefore, BRI lays a lot of emphasis on tracing back the route and the road that was taken up by Ibn Bottuta or Marco Polo. Those are the strengths on which BRI now wants to build up the current century's concept of Belt and Road Initiative. It has currently five focus areas on which it is working. Number one, policy coordination. Number two, it wants to facilitate connectivity. Number three, it lays emphasis on unimpeded trade, seamless way of trading between countries and regions. Number four, financial integration. And number five, people to people bond or contacts. I will only 
briefly point out the last one. There is now a lot of emphasis in building bonds between people, between cultures, and between faiths. In the last BRI summit in 2019 in Beijing, President Xi Jinping laid out his idea of bringing back every year 10,000 members from BRI countries from innovation sectors to work with Chinese counterparts and get to know their Chinese counterparts in China. It also wants to bring in 20,000 people from political parties, think tanks, academia, and civil society organizations to come and visit China and interact with their Chinese counterparts and their Chinese colleagues. So these are ideas and avenues through which BRI will bring back together bonds between people, build collective cultures, and bring people of different faiths to work together, going back to the earlier roots. With that, I will now hand over the floor to Pravez Karim Abbasi to give his comments. Thank you very much, sir. First of all, I'd like to thank General Munir, head of BIPS, and also Mrs. Afar Saban, edited Hakka Cuban, for having me over here. Again, I believe all three, dis uh, all two discussions, the uh, previous two discussions have co covered ground comprehensively. So I would like to cover, or I'd like to shed light on issues that are less discussed, or else there would be no value in all of us sitting together. And one active disclaimer, I am on, under no way uh, working in any project funded by the Chinese or the Americans, because we Bangladeshis, like most Asians, tend to see things in black and white. I'm completely gray, like a ronin, a samurai without a master. So with that, in, with that uh, over the way, let me just give you a quick outline of how I'm going to hopefully proceed with the presentation. First of all would be the rationale, as I'd like to think about what the Chinese want from BRI. Number two would be some pertinent facts of BRI post-COVID. Number three would be, and this would be the part where many people would be interested to perk up, exploring the debt dynamics on a global scale. And number four would be looking into security issues and new challenges. Number five would be some tech-related issues, also related with BRI. Number six would be alternate responses by United, the United States of America and European Union. And number seven uh, would be basically what could be the way forward for BRI in the near future, according to me. Again, just uh, early days. Now, if you if you talk about BRI, and if you look into the Mandarin, and apologies to my Mandarin speaking friends, it's known as Yi Dai Yi Lu, one belt, one road. And again, it is emanates from the concept of Tian Jia, which is all under one heaven. And that's why China is the middle kingdom, that everything should converge with China at the center. It's a cultural, social, political, and historical mindset that has transmitted China's way of thinking and interacting with the rest of the world. But this is where I think, and this is my personal contribution is, if you want to understand BRI, you have to think about China's most famous landmark, the Great Wall of China. Actually, there have been several Great Walls of China, but whenever China feels that it's under aggression, it tries to build up a physical, a virtual foundation, which gives it a sense of security. So just like the Great Wall was there to protect itself against the Hunnish or again uh, other nomadic uh, raiders, the Mongols, it is again with the if you can think about BRI minus the bricks, it's in terms of physical terms, yes, roads, bridges, highways. In terms of uh, finance, it is again as already pointed out by General Munir and Dr. Fahmi that happened, is again this is about fintech, blockchain technology. It's about, uh, again, a digital currency, uh, electronic payments. It's about, again, uh, health silk route. It's about, again, geospatial uh, silk routes. So again, multiple silk routes are over there. But countries are being firmly brought under a sinocentric world order, an alternate world order. And this is where the credit of the Chinese comes in. Because what have they done? They married geopolitics with geoeconomics. The concept of a strategic trade 
and concept of strategic state that has merged to bring BRI into such a potent force for better or for worse. That's the first thing that we need to go forward. And number two is, why did it come about? We always discuss about this, that the Chinese had need of basically shipping off their spare uh, spare dollar or foreign exchange reserves, spare capital. But also, we must uh, also understand that the Chinese Communist Party's command over 1 nearly 1.4 billion people in excess rests on giving them an idea of a better tomorrow. And again, the levers of power for them to be entrenched, for them not to be challenged and to be guided according to the Chinese school of thought, that is again what Xi Jinping has managed to do. One, he has managed to hold on or centralize his hold on power and he has become the most influential man after Chairman Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. His hold on the Chinese Communist Party, now his confrontation with the West that has also raised his popularity. And he has managed to sell the idea that he is the strong man. He's holding up China's vision to the rest of the world. So see, he has managed to get a large portion of the Chinese living within China and outside China to be invested in the idea of BRI. So whether danger or whether Xi Jinping stays in power or anybody else, BRI is, has been launched. It will not be redacted. The fate of the Chinese Communist Party, the fate of China is inextricably linked to BRI. That's the first opening salvo, for better or for worse. Number two, debt dynamics. And this is where, again, people on both sides of the divide start to get, uh, what did I say, very excited and animated. But I have referring to some data, because we cannot talk without data. And we cannot do this research because we don't have the funds or the expertise. But Again, from William and Mary College, there's a very extensive data on, which is focused on nearly $845 billion worth of Chinese projects from all the way from 2003 to 2021. We are just picking up a few uh, facts of this, that which we could verify. And again, the rest is up for discussion. Now, the first of all is China has become the financier of last resorts. How so? If we look into this, in terms of spending on annual international development, in terms of financial commitments, China spends around $85 billion annually. That means it outspends the United States of America two to one. But over here, debt rather than your, or your development assistance or grants is the main vehicle of its uh, providing assistance to low middle income countries. So it's a debt driven model. There is no argument about this. And since the introduction of BRI, China has maintained uh, a ratio of loans to grants. If I come to this, 31 is to one. It means if $31 are provided in terms of loans, $1 is provided grants. It's perfectly fine, but that's a Chinese way of doing this. And this, why has this come about? And that has led to questions about hidden debt, that is questioned about debt trap, but what is the essential rationale if you look into this? Now, there are two ways of comparing about this. One is sovereign Chinese lending, that means again Chinese government providing project loans. Another one is BRI centric projects, where the Chinese government itself is not providing, but again, uh, state, the state owned banks, they are the ones who are in the forefront in terms of providing commercial loans. And because again, BRI is a large decentralized approach where many of the entities within China are involved. Now, what are the companies that are in over here? State owned commercial banks such as Bank of China, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, and China Construction Bank. They play a very active role in providing loans. And what is the typical loan that is provided? The typical loan has an interest of around 4.2%. Uh, the grace period is less than two years and typically maturity period is less than 10 years. These are some of the facts. And again, the idea is that and mo most of the loan is given up in terms of dollar EU denominated loans, which is, a, which is also a very smart way of doing this because then it relieves the pressure on the one and again, maintains competitiveness of Chinese exports. 
Now, along with this, we have seen that with the inauguration of BRI, the overseas lending activities have gone up five-folds within the first five years of BRI, which is understandable. The number of mega projects, which have been over $500 million, that has also tripled during the first five years of BRI. But many of these projects are given in terms of high risk, high reward mindset. And as we say, no risk, no gain. So in this case, collateralization of debt comes into play. What happens over here? That often in order to cover, in order to recover debts, in order to basically cover fiduciary obligations, what happens is future export receipts are often collateralized. And this is the part where, which leads to a lot of controversy. But again, for Chinese companies who are investing abroad, they need sure returns of their money. So, and again, this is the point where the scope of disagreement starts to take place. The Chinese way of doing business is different from the Western way of doing business. This is a, this is a fundamental fact. And the Chinese make no bones about this. And because, as has been pointed out with Professor Fahmi De Khatun, there's a huge infrastructure demand all around the world. So as a result, countries are willing to take the risk. But once you take the risk, unfortunately, if your internal macroeconomic management is not sound, then those Chinese loans that you are taking in, often they become onerous or they become excessive in terms of burden. And that is what has happened. That is what has transpired. Now, in this case, in this case, if you look into this, state-owned companies, now their lending has gone up by 70% post-BRI, and they're the ones who are in the driving seat. Now, that has been, uh, positive results because you can mobilize a lot of resources, but that has negative results. What are the negative implications of this, or adverse implications? At least 42 countries around the world have public debt exposure towards of the Chinese, which is greater than 10% of the GDP. Well, it's not the fault of the Chinese. Those countries should have thought better when once they're taking the loan. Number two is the underreported debts. Those amount to $385 billion. Because if a country is giving loan to another country, that is what is uh, uh, reported by World Bank. But when, again, let's say loans are being provided to state-owned companies, to state-owned banks, to special purpose joint vehicles now for cooperation. Now, when those loans are given, those are underreported. Now, that also in itself isn't bad. But the question is, is there adequate transparency and accountability? And that is coming to the fore. What are the problems that we have had in recent times? Now, at least 35% of BRI infrastructure projects have face major implementation problems. Why? Because of corruption scandals in the host countries, because of labor violation rights, because of environmental hazards, and because of public protests. But it's not because of, but if you compare it to the Chinese government's infrastructure investments, the number, amount of problem faced by them is only 21%. That means BRI, because of its scope, because of the fact that it brings in divergent actors, means it's more complicated to manage. That's number one. And in terms of BRI funded projects, it takes around, on average, 1047 days to complete. Chinese government funded infrastructure projects takes around 771 days. So there is a wide difference because multiple actors are involved over here. This is one thing that we need to understand about GVRI. And in terms of project suspension, between 2013 and 2021, over $11.5 billion worth of project has been canceled in Malaysia, uh, 1.5 billion in Kazakhstan, and again, nearly 1 billion in Bolivia. Again, that doesn't sound the death knell of, Bolivia, of BRI because that means it's an organic project. BRI from infancy, it has now grown into adolescence. So what we say that growing blues it is encountering with this. So it is adopting, it is evolving. Now, as a result, what has happened over here is that, yes, even the Chinese leadership has realized, as mentioned by General Muri Zaman, that there's a need for reducing corruption. There's a need for increasing accountability. There's a need for coming up with transparent procurement standards. 
how much it will be implemented with post-COVID effects, that, that remains to be seen. Last one. Okay. Let me just now go on to the security angles. And we can, again, I can come up with other issues later on. Another thing is that as the Chinese investment has expanded, it has also faced security problems. 84% of Chinese investments take place in countries with medium to high risk. And as a result, we have seen this unique emergence of Chinese private security companies, which are providing prote protection in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Somaliland. In Africa, there's at least 1 million Chinese migrant workers. You have at least 2,000 state-owned companies operating over there, generating $40 billion of infrastructure investment, and at least 350 activities, high security risk uh, attacks against Chinese nationals have come in. But the one thing that is of worry is this many of these, the private security companies, by definition, they are owned by the state, or at least 51% of state mobile owned capital. And most of the personnel either come from the People's Liberation Army, the military, or the police, which is fine because Russia has the Wagner Group, America had the now disbanded Blackwater. So the Chinese require to also basically the security concerns are key. Can Chinese companies spend about $10 billion annually to provide protection for their personnel overseas? So again, I've just managed to cover the debt dynamics and the security aspect, but when we have time, and when it comes, to, uh, hopefully when I get the floor back, I'd love to talk about the tech aspects of this and where it's going in. And also again, what are the alternate responses like Build Back Better and also Global Gateway. Thank you. Well, we thank you very much for giving a detailed account of the financial and the economic aspects of BRI, particularly in this loan disbursement. You also did point out that BRI has a domestic Chinese connotation, which essentially is linked to the Chinese dream. To achieve the Chinese dream, materialization of BRI is fundamental to the Chinese internal politics because it has tremendous financial and economic consequences internally. But also please note that BRI also works on a concept of hub and spoke. It is not a multilateral agreement. It is bilateral in basis. So each country gets into a bilateral agreement with China. And these are binding agreements. So every country needs to behave responsibly when getting into the agreement and then further implementing the projects that it chooses. In selection of the projects, a greater autonomy is now being given to the member countries so they can pick and choose projects of their priority within the overall umbrella of the concept of BRI. So BRI is constantly evolving and it is getting into new grounds which was not there before. Some of the projects uh, that Pervez rightly mentioned has been sort of cancelled, but some have not been cancelled. Some have been reviewed. For example, the East West Railway in Malaysia was reviewed, not cancelled. So the review process is now becoming an integral part of the implementation of BRI projects, which is also being accepted by BRI. We will also come into discussion with the role of AIIB, which plays a major role in implementing the BRI projects and concepts. And we'll also see the contradictions that lie within that implementation by non-BRI countries taking advantage of AIIB. So these are some of the key issues I lay before you for discussion. The floor is now open. Please feel free to ask a question, give your comments, opinions. And I think the first uh, question will come from Mr. Naveed Safiullah.
who is a joint secretary in the ARD, I just in the government. Remarks. Please, uh, whatever you ask or give a comment, please be brief so that we go to as many people as possible. Thank Mr. you Shibira. so much. Thank you so much, uh, respected chair, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening to you all. I'm uh, Mr. Navid Shafila, working as Joint Secretary in the ERD. We have been much enlightened. I mean, all the issues have been covered by so far. The insightful comments. I would like to give special thanks to the panelists and others. I'm feeling sickly. I'm sorry for that because today I was good uh, in the uh, in the morning, but now I'm feeling very badly. So I will just brief and give my comments. First of all, this is the month of victory. Month of victory. So I I I, I deeply uh, respect our father of the nation, our four national leaders, martyrs who have sacrificed their lives and and given us an independent and sovereign Bangladesh. And uh, I would just tell one thing <laughs> in one word that so far we have been discussing a very a very critical issue, Belt and Road Initiative. So I couldn't but take myself to come here <laughs> to say something about it. I would just say in one word because I'm feeling badly that is this Belt and Road Initiative will will increase, have already increased the regional, con seamless regional connectivity. And I don't want to discuss anything else, but much has been discussed. So that's uh, all from my point of view. Thank you so much once again. Mr. Shapiro, thank you. I uh, thank you for coming in spite of uh, your health conditions. Thank you very much. Another tool of the overall concept of BRI is to take the Chinese investment to BRI countries. So, so far we see over 100 special economic zones that China has established in different member countries where Chinese companies are now going and setting up their own industries and they are also setting up production bases from where they are also capable of exporting to other countries. So the economic zone concept is another tool through which BRI is being pushed to many countries. Our next question is going to come from Ambassador Shamim. Sorry, you have the floor. Just wait for the microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as mentioned by the chair, my name is Shamim Hanad. I'm a former ambassador. Now, well, this uh, concept of uh, BRI it really uh, appeals to my interest and imagination. That's the reason I came here with an open mind to hear from others, particularly for the panel of experts that we have tabled. Uh, I feel that uh, it's a bit early days for BRI to be a judge in the context of the interest, uh, the benefit that can accrue to the recipient countries. It was established, as you say, back in 2013, less than 10 years. But uh, I feel that most of the BRI systems that are being extended to the recipient countries are basically bilateral systems. What uh, have to be seen, how much extra have been given to these countries if we are uh, even not there? Uh, this is number one, but I would be more interested in hearing from the experts the regional connectivity aspect of the both regional and, and global connectivity. Uh, we haven't seen any uh, project, connectivity project, both regional and global in, in complete form which could be a glaring example of how much benefits these uh, projects have uh, accrued to the people. And as regards my own region where we are located in this uh, South Asia, we have seen CPEC, we have mentioned about one corridor that China will use to reach the warm water through Myanmar. But what about Bangladesh? You mentioned Chittagong. Uh, would it be possible without India being involved? How India's, Sorry? Would it be possible to reach Chittagong port for China without India being involved? I don't see any other way how it could come unless it comes through the sea. Uh, so I think India factor is there unless India joins the, that corridor. Uh, what is the future of that, uh, that project? And also, I would like to hear from the experts. We haven't really brought up here the, the issue 
of uh, Kuwait. Possibly there, I mean, do you see that this two concept could be in some kind of uh, conflicts as regards uh, putting both the concepts in place? The Kuwait being more in terms of uh, maybe some kind of military cooperation and BRI being in, uh, a vehicle of economic cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. The next question. Thank you, um, Lali Koryas, Ms. Professor at the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Uh, this has been an excellent organization of materials by both uh, Pamidapa and uh, Mr. Pavels. Um, um, so uh, my actually um, sort of uh, sort of question would be a uh, question or kind of observation is that uh, as um, I think Pervez pointed out and uh, Moriza Basar also pointed out that uh, how uh, BRI is at the heart of uh, China's socio-cultural, historical, and political uh, sort of imagination. Uh, while uh, I mean, we'll probably talk about BPW later on. Uh, but American policy has always been isolationist uh, in nature, starting from the Bongo Doctrine and later on. And because of their geographical separation from the rest of the world, what happens is that it is difficult for uh, American and American government to sort of garner public support domestically which has not been the problem for uh, Chinese uh, governments, Japanese government. Also, uh, you know, with the, with the 20, uh, 2022 and 2024 elections coming up in America, uh, the future of BPW will largely depend on that. Uh, on the other hand, as you say, leadership continuity. I mean, I'm not arguing that democracy is bad or uh, good or any, anything. I'm not arguing uh, for, for any or advocating for any uh, isms. Uh, but there is a leadership continuity in the case of China, which actually makes BRI more sustainable. And for countries like Sri Lanka, countries like Bangladesh, when we needed money, there was no, no World Bank, no IMF coming. I remember in 2015, when President Xi Jinping was to, was to visit Bangladesh, I was asked that, why are you signing this project, which have, you know, much uh, higher uh, um, interest rates? But if you look at uh, the latest reports, um, one was uh, published in The Diplomat. Uh, the rate is 1.23 for majority of the projects, uh, the interest rate. Uh, so this is something we need to uh, remember, uh, which is much lower than any other you know, international sort of uh, interest rates uh, that we can borrow money from. Uh, so that is why when there is no other sectors to provide money to either Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or other countries, then uh, obviously China would be one, one sort of you know, possible uh, funder. Um, uh, people to people contact. This is one area that uh, Barbara uh, mentioned. Um, so, uh, in Shanti Niketan, uh, the case of uh, Tagore, where uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, representatives speak better Bengali than we do or the uh, people of Kolkata do. In, uh, from my Sri Lankan friends, I heard that Chinese speak better Sinhala than some of the Sinhalis. So, you have to see the soft core appeal. They are talking about unity in diversity, in young philosophy, whereas uh, westernization leads to a kind of singularity. So, um, so there is a huge soft power appeal uh, that comes with BRI. This is something we are forgetting. We are seeing this from a very strategic perspective, uh, dead trap diplomacy, and um, uh, Sri Lanka High Commissioner, his Excellency is here, but um, um, there was an article published by Loyal Institute in, um, I think, November uh, this year. Uh, it argued that Sri Lanka's external debt to um, Japan is 10%, China about 10%, and to other multilateral organization uh, majority, like 40% to 25% uh, and things like that. So uh, this debt trap diplomacy, uh, diplomacy sounds very appealing to argue against BRI, but what is the validity of this, uh, you know, with data and everything that uh, Western scholars themselves argue against it. Sorry, I myself took a lot of time. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Landifu. Yes, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. The whole issue has been very comprehensively covered. I have just two points. About Chinese investment, there is a lot of humor propaganda going on. Then China has built their ports, etc., particularly among uh, Sri Lanka, Maldi, etc., places. Of course, they are now trying to get to Vietnam, which is all. Is, I don't know what stage it is. Uh, now, uh, can you tell me 
how how much of the this propaganda is true because they said they will take over all this oil so our the people of our country came up our magazine our journalists our elite they all say no don't Bangladesh should not get too much of loan from China in the long run they will take it over that's a common propaganda and western world is very much in it now I would like to know first question how much you think in this 10 or 12 years 15 years time how many of these projects is the defaulter to pay back the money and I'm sure the panel and uh, they know what is how much it is uh, secondly um, <coughs> Uh, about China and Maldives, which is an example they always quote. They're going to take over. When you tell somebody, why don't you get some money from China and they're good in building the material or other things, otherwise also. But nobody really tells in real time that they got that, that sort of thing they have done in their last few years or something. It's, it's, it's a really, if you look at the Chinese, help to these poorer countries. They've been very generous for many poor countries in this region as well as in the African countries. So I think, my, my opinion is that it's a great uh, gesture of China to really help the poorer countries, whether Asia and Africa, we have too many people like that. But some of the Western, I'm sorry to comment, their interest is power gain. They have not been that generous. And what when it was mentioned, the interest rate for the loan is much lower than Western banks and countries. From that point of view, if you look, apparently they are quite generous to help poorer countries. And they have not shown an hegemony to any country. Chinese history doesn't show they have been involved in somebody's uh, sovereignty or politics. That's what we are today, if you look at it. I personally feel that way. So it is always they are trying some, it is totally pro political propaganda to jump upon up on the uh, China and also a country that came into it. I would like to have some explanation on this, if you could elaborate and tell us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, sir. And I would like. Just to mention before you, before you continue, that uh, we are all speaking here in our personal capacities and we are speaking on the record. Uh, with that, house rule, can I go to you, sir, in the corner? You have the floor? Yes. Thank you. First of all, let me thank uh, Dhaka Tribune and BIPS uh, for organizing yet another very interesting discussion on a very pertinent topic. Uh, thank the panelists for their very insightful views, uh, wide-ranging, encompassing different aspects of the issue. Uh, I would like to focus uh, my intervention briefly on uh, three aspects of what we have discussed on BRI. First is, number one, the massive uh, and comprehensive scale and scope of the BRI and uh, the, uh, the projects envisaged as part of that. A few words about CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And a few words about uh, discussions uh, which we have heard and uh, views we have uh, uh, heard about uh, the perceived concerns about debt sustainability and the possible use of uh, projects and as part of the BRI to attain uh, geopolitical objectives. Uh, so, as General Saab, you rightly pointed out, uh, more than 140 countries have signed up to uh, the BRI uh, initiative. Uh, Recently, the Asia-Pacific Conference of uh, the uh, BRI uh, uh, Summit was held in June 2021. That was held in a virtual format. SCAP and other regional countries were part of that. And it was attended by over 30 parties, including foreign and economic uh, ministers of partner countries and representatives of the UN, as well as other international organizations. So it's essentially, I mean, with, with growing time, it essentially reflects the desire among developing countries to emulate the successful model of China's economic development and the recognition 
uh, that it can provide a path towards sustainable development, a greater prosperity, and a regional peace and stability. Uh, there is also a regional consensus that BRI offers the opportunity for regional countries to not only learn from uh, what uh, the development models have uh, laid for China and other countries, but in fact to leapfrog to the 21st century economy. Uh, several European countries, like you, like you pointed out, have uh, formed a group with China uh, to be part of the BRI initiative. In fact, Italy was uh, one of the first G7 countries to, to officially join the BRI. Uh, now coming over to CPAC. Uh, CPAC was conceived in 2013 as a flagship and pilot project of the BRI initiative. The primary objective was to connect China's western province of Xinjiang uh, to Pakistan's deep sea port of Kawadar to a network of uh, energy, connectivity, and infrastructure projects and to investment. Uh, so CPEC now, as it stands, it offers the opportunity to connect uh, the, the country, the deep sea port, and China, Western province, to Central Asia, to Afghanistan. And in that context, I think it offers a very, very uh, useful opportunity uh, to the international community and the regional countries to stabilize Afghanistan and to ensure its peace and prosperity in the longer term. As of now, uh, uh, of the one trillion dollars which were allocated by China as part of the BRI projects, over seventy billion dollars were envisaged for the CPEC. Uh, thus far, the CPEC projects have created over seventy-five thousand job opportunities in Pakistan and have generated direct investment of over twenty-five billion dollars. Uh, so it's it's very interesting to note, even at the height of pandemic. Not a single uh, Pakistani worker associated with the BRI projects was, uh, was uh, laid off. Not a single Chinese worker, uh, expat worker working on BRI projects was withdrawn from Pakistan. That's a very interesting fact. Uh, so existing projects have contributed to Pakistan's economic recovery, while major CPEC projects are proceeding smoothly towards uh, the, the commissioning phase. Now, finally, a few words about uh, what we have heard uh, about debt sustainability, uh, the, the, the so-called debt trap, and the uh, geopolitical objectives of, of this entire initiative. So I, I, I could not help but notice that uh, the, the entire discussion has been framed in a context that uh, it, 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 you, you can't separate the geopolitical objectives, the so-called these motives from the economic factors, uh, which, which are the, the primary driving factors behind the BRI project. And in, in case, I think it was also mentioned by General, General Saab, that it uh, somehow it, it it comes out as a competition to uh, the Indo-Pacific Pacific strategy, as 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 I understood. So I think it's very pertinent to note that the BRI was conceived way back in 2013 and 2014, if, uh, and the Indo-Pacific strategy that came uh, much later, much later. So it was uh, conceived in a different uh, time space. Uh, and there is increasing research which points to a very limited evidence of China using its so-called debt trap diplomacy to gain geopolitical influence. Uh, there is increasing research that uh, the primary driving factors behind BRI are economic, trade, commercial, investment, to emulate that model in uh, the regional countries and beyond. And uh, moreover, what's, what's important to note is that there is research from independent sources that China's international development financing system is not effectively geared towards advancing geopolitical objectives in this context. So, while we, we, we do hear concerns and uh, questions uh, surrounding uh, issues like, uh, like these, uh, but the facts on ground have to be kept in view. So this narrative, uh, our concern is that this, this narrative wrongfully portrays both China and the developing partners uh, in, in a very, uh, very negative light. I think the partner countries do actively shape outcomes within the China's so, international development. Let me just keep it brief so you can yes, go to let, other questions. Let me just conclude. Thank you. So it, it negatively portrays because what we have learned from our experience through CPEC is that the partner countries do engage with China through their, their divergent uh, agendas, their priorities, and they help in shaping China's international financial development system. So thank you very much once again thank and, you. Uh, for, for the discussion. Um, we'll first go to Shubham. For the next question. My name is Shubham and I'm a uh, fourth year at the University of California Riverside and I'm working at the uh, Bips Institute as a research intern. So uh, there are a lot of uh, concerns especially regarding the youth about like the project and how 
the future of the BR essence is the early days and eventually it is we that are going to take over how we deal with the project soon. So I'm just going to echo some of the sentiments that me and my peers have had about this issue. So before I go into the challenges, the Belt and Road Initiative projects actually provide a unique opportunity, which is the synergy between the sustainable development goals and the BRI project itself. So uh, as you all know, some of the BRI project, projects, they focus on um, a cleaner energy consumption or projects that um, stem from just cleaner fuel in general. So these are the SDGs that it can tackle. But the concern that we have is with particular of the SDG 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. Because sometimes the sustenance of these SDG products come through non-inclusive practices. So my question uh, would be the first question is, do you think in the capacity, Ms. Uh, Parvester and uh, Farmer Delman, do you think uh, as your seasoned economist, do you think these projects would be able to synergize with SDG 16 goal particularly? The second question that I have uh, is going to actually kind of talk about the dichotomy of the benefits and um, the setbacks of the BRI. So, as you know, a lot of the uh, huge narrative that exists is that Chinese state-owned enterprises can sometimes afford to bleed money to sustain their projects, which oftentimes their, uh, let's say, Western or North American counterparts cannot do. So there's, uh, there's this idea that there's an unfair competition being held in terms of these project investments in the, in the nations that the BRI projects are in. So then you also have the tendency, which kind of compounds on the issue, to brush aside these challenges and just focus on the benefits. So you have these negative aspects, and the dichotomy that I present is, even though it's early days, you have all these big institutes coming up with research. For example, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, they have come up with a very comprehensive assessment of the narrative of whether the BRI actually engages in debt traps. And surprisingly, they've assessed that, especially in countries such as South Asia, they've assessed that, no, the debt, debt trap is essentially not the main reason for these countries' mismanagement. Um, even if we talk about the Hamandra report in Sri Lanka, they've actually tagged uh, the state's, uh, let's say, lower capacity to manage their national debt, as opposed to the struggles of the BRI. So these are the... Um, questions that I would like to present to the speakers. Thank you very much. Okay, the next question, Bruce, do you have the floor? Uh, my question to the uh, Professor Farmida and uh, Dr. Abbasi, that you have talked about the uh, stability, transparency, then uh, the corruption issues regarding these BRI projects. How to maintain this transparency, this stability, in all the countries, is it through democracy, is it through societal integration, or through totalitarian system? Because these are being talked in the world affairs now. And especially for Bangladesh, the road connectivity with China, it was supposed to be through Myanmar to that point, to our Technaf and other places, and uh, through Rakhine, what General General Sarah told. Just here comes the question of the Rohingya issues, which is a center point of the present day conflict in the world. Do you think this Rohingya issue can be solved in near future without solving this problem amicably? We just cannot put to this project and link in China. And so far I can gauge and I can assume that there will be long drawn this uh, hybrid warfare or in, uh, insurgency or some sort of something like that in the Rakhine and Arakan areas. And our Chitaran hill tracks will also be bogged down as the Rohingya, Rohingyas are staying there, one million Rohingya. And uh, Myanmar is a repressive government, totally isolated from the world. And they are very ruthless. They don't, uh, they, you just look at them. So how can we negotiate this problem with them? How can we resettle these Rohingyas there? They killed 25,000 Rohingyas, burned their houses, raped them. So these are the associated issues linked with this BRI project must be addressed. So first, please uh, you just clarify how to manage this, how to ensure this transparency, these uh, corruptions, this uh, good governance, 
is it through a repressive regime like Myanmar, sort of something like that in the in our country or everywhere in the world, or to democracy, or to some sort of system? Please specify. Thank you. Thank you. A big question that should be pondered upon is that as a signatory country, whether we'll have access to the corridor. As it goes now, the BCM corridor is not getting implemented. So a shortcut has been found to implement CMEC, China Myanmar Economic Corridor, but that leaves out Bangladesh. So the primary benefit that we should be getting out of being a member country is through joining a corridor. So if we don't have access to the corridor, how are we going to implement much of our trade goals and objectives and other benefits of BRI? Because uh, if you can imagine, if you know the BCIM corridor, which is the, also the Asian highway corridor, it enters India from Myanmar. From Myanmar, it enters India Northeast, and then it comes to Bangladesh. So unless India agrees to that roadmap, then Bangladesh will not be joining the BCIM corridor unless we are able to redraw the concept of the corridor again. These are some of the questions we should be asking. How shall we get into the corridor? All right, sir, you have the floor here. Next question. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers and the panelists. I've learned a great deal today, and that always makes me happy when, uh, uh, when I can achieve that. Uh, so I have a specific question for the panelists. Uh, and this is on the debt trap, but a rather different way of answering, of asking about it. In order to repay a debt, a country has to successfully export to the creditor. The, the size of the loans involved here is running up towards the trillions of dollars, which means that either China has to reverse what has been its historical uh, economic policy, which is to run a large uh, current account surplus, or uh, the countries like uh, Germany, the United States, will have to take the exports from the countries that have barred under the BRI, and that surplus that uh, is earned by Bangladesh, India, and so forth, will have to be used to repay the, uh, the Chinese uh, loans. I would like to hear some uh, Clarification from the uh, from the panelists to what they think might happen here. Thank you. Any other questions, Dr. Nadia? Please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my actually, it's a very basic uh, sort of a observation I would like to share. As we see that BRI is, uh, you know, it's heading toward. Its objective is heading towards global connectivity, I, as we understand. But my very basic uh, observation is uh, when internal, uh, considering internal infrastructure, you know, it uh, gives us so much challenge. So uh, whether we are, I'm talking about readiness. So whether we are uh, ready with our internal infrastructure, in regards to connectivity, I mean the roads we are, um, you know, having right now within the country. So first of all, I think we need to uh, focus on our internal uh, infrastructure more. So in regards to roads, because uh, we are talking about connectivity with the different zones, economic zones. So definitely we need to improve internal uh, infrastructure, we should uh, focus on these issues, which will definitely uh, head towards re regional connectivity. It will make smoother and also in the long run, global connectivity. And second observation is that 
mega projects. As we see that uh, in regards to inclusivity of women, I should mention that I am actually, I'm Nadia Bintamin, I'm heading one of the Women Entrepreneurs Association. So my uh, priority is women entrepreneurs, definitely. So when it comes to mega projects, I find really a uh, challenge women entrepreneurs to get into this uh, fair and transparent uh, procurement system to get into this uh, system. So uh, though women uh, promise sustainability, cleanliness, and they remain, I think they remain very honest in their business. Still, we are far from this uh, supply chain. We want to be included in this mega projects, uh, women, these two basic observations. So one is internal readiness. I think we need to uh, more focus on this, definitely, uh, to get uh, regional and global connectivity, ensure. And second is women inclusivity in the mega projects. Thank you so much. Dr. Nadi, you bring up two very, very pertinent points. Whether Number one is whether are we ready to link up to the corridor internally? And are the BRI projects on the concept, are they gender inclusive or not? I'm sure our panelists will address these issues. Our next question is coming from Aisha Kabir from Prothamalo. I think I'll address my question to Parvez, if that's okay. It's, um, uh, with this BRI, it's obvious that there are parties, regional powers or superpowers who are not terribly thrilled with it. And so uh, Bangladesh is naturally will face certain pressures about joining or it has already joined BRI, but as you see already, there's many stumbling blocks in the way as General Munir was pointing out that we don't even have the roots to be a part of this to, or to reap benefits from it. So. Um, Speaking from our track record, Bangladesh, uh, unfortunately, hasn't been one of the best negotiators, hasn't been very good at the negotiating table in various uh, international uh, dealings that we've had. So what do you think are the stumbling blocks that will be put before us as a member of BRI by the regional or superpowers who are opposed by it? And what do you think should be our negotiating skills or points to? deal with that. Thank you, Asha. Uh, the next question is going to come from High Commissioner of Sri Lanka. Thank you, General. Thank you very much for putting this panel uh, together. I've been enjoying these uh, discussions for some time and also reading about them. Um, I was not going to make any comments earlier, but I thought since Sri Lanka was on the shooting gallery several times. I thought I should just make a very short comment because I think this whole issue should be, be taken at a longer discussion, not a short comment. Uh, first thing is we should look at countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, from both subjective and objective conditions. We should look at the histories. Very often we forget the histories of these countries. Um, we tend to take a very short memory what you call lane on these situations. And often this is also clouded by the kind of propaganda and also the uh, benchmark that being created by the West. And this is something we've been dealing with in our country because uh, it is for not for anything. Sri Lanka has a literacy rate of nearly 98%. We had free education, you know, still free education is on. We still have almost uh, what you call free transportation, free medical service. Now, these things are done with what you call the people welfare. And this was always objected to by more affluent countries about welfare states. That's one. Number two is, just like Bangladesh, we underwent so many hardships, what a lot of people don't realize. We underwent, apart from 400 years of colonialism, which ripped the country apart and left the country almost tattered. Then we went through a 30 year war of terrorism. By the time terrorism actually started, we had the threshold of almost beating Singapore. That was just knocked off. Then we had the tsunami, which took off the whole of the coastal area. 
Then you had another terrorist attack last Easter. Now, I was the director general of all the World Heritage Sites. Our tourism was so good at some part, we charge a dollar ticket, by the way. I'm sure some of you have traveled to Sri Lanka and seen what Sri Lanka is. We charge a dollar ticket, and by noon, often some of these sites it featured about $40,000 US dollars. And Sri Lanka was featured after the war ended still as the best destination. Then you have the Easter thing coming up. Now, having said that, we had also the issue of Western funding agencies who took a very dim about people's conveniences, what we had, like welfare. Welfare, they just, or just objected. Recently, I have spoken to some of the, one of the funding agencies came by and they are speaking so negatively about this country's welfare thing you offer to the poorer people. I mean, these are massive poverty you are talking about our country. Let's face it. This was inherited by history to us. But from colonialism, Mughal, Mughal exploitation, then now you have other countries exploiting you. Then you, after 50 years, you have been able to come to this pressure. But what I'm trying to impress upon you all is that how many people actually help us in this situation? I'm not holding a pen for China or America or any other country, but in our country, we offered certain other countries conveniences. So, half of you offered to another neighboring country, they said, No, sorry, we don't want it. What do we do? We turn to China. And still, as my colleague told, it was a very low end interest rate compared to what the other interest rates we get from some of the Western banks or funding agencies. So, I'm just trying to tell, I mean, I should, we could be talking for a whole session on this, but we should be looking at the broader picture without seeing immediately this whole debt traps you are talking about. Even if the debt trap comes, who was there to help us? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question is from Ambassador Shah. Well, uh, I think uh, we've gone through a lot of uh, useful exchange of information on this interesting topic, Belt and Road Initiative, connecting the world. Uh, I just want to make a small point, that is, uh, the Asian Highway, uh, when it was proposed many, many years back, uh, it linked, obviously, uh, uh, right from China and uh, all the uh, southeastern countries, including Bangladesh, including later on, the railway was connected. And I think still it is, uh, Bangladesh has signed it, and it is there on the table. Uh, on top of it, we now have this Belt and Road Initiative, and you mentioned that uh, we are not yet connected. Uh, let me add over here that uh, the, the, the Bangladesh side proposed to China that as they were connected, uh, Thailand and uh, Myanmar was connected, uh, and Thailand was connected with China. So we need a little push to get connected uh, from this particular connectivity into Bangladesh. And that's also on the table. As you rightly said, uh, this has not seen the light of the day uh, as we, we intend to have uh, seen it. This is something, uh, I think it is more or less ready. The Asian Highway, when we were kids, we, we, we heard so much about Asian Highway. It has not made much move. So Belt and Road Initiative, uh, we have seen certain big projects that, uh, that has taken place within Bangladesh. And that is quite uh, evident and visible to us. Uh, on top of this, Hamida, Dr. Hamida was mentioning that uh, whatever we are dealing with with uh, uh, China, uh, China is connecting, uh, is, connect, uh, is getting connected uh, with Bangladesh through our exports and import. Uh, I don't know, Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, has, uh, you know, tentacles in every area. Uh, it means our exports and imports has also to be to be seen. And you are talking now about digital connectivity, you are talking about other connectivity. Uh, obviously, uh, if the country is not benefited, the country wouldn't be interested. And I'm sure Bangladesh is uh, going to gain uh, a lot out of this, uh, because, uh, you know, we need, we need to develop this particular area. And there is a big gap. And uh, I think this has also helped in uh, bringing 
more and more development programs in the country. Uh, I don't want to go into detail, but uh, I'm sure we have heard a lot. These are my observations. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, that was the last question from the floor. We will now go back to our panelists for the response and the comments. First, Dr. Fomida. Thank you very much for all the comments and questions. I think a lot of uh, interest have been generated. Um, I will just address a few because uh, experts are there and I'm not also uh, qualified to uh, respond to many of the questions which are um, political uh, in nature, also related to security and strategic issues. Um, to start with, one of the questions from um, Shubham or somebody regarding the uh, SDGs and BRI, particularly you referred to how, uh, how BRI is linked to SDG 16, a uh, very tough uh, thing, uh, issue indeed. In fact, if you look at the BRI, whole BRI approach, um, you know, reduction of poverty to, through economic growth or infrastructure connectivity, unimpeded trade, energy um, modernization, focus on green um, and low carbon technology, and also focus on people's livelihood, employment, education, etc. So um, these are very much in line with SDGs, many of them. SDG goal one, which is about with, um, poverty eradication, two is uh, reduction of hunger, uh, then um, six, uh, 12, these are all you know, related to employment generation and also climate issue, SDG uh, 13. Now SDG 16, which, which talks about peace, um, justice and institution, stronger institutions. Uh, in fact, that is the greatest challenge, challenge in all the countries in the world. But if you just take peace as a concept of not only purely you know, uh, political concept, but also peace uh, through economic cooperation, from that point of view, you can link it to SDG 16. But as I have mentioned, the other aspects of SDG 16, which, which is really uh, you know, the pillar of implementation of all the other SDGs, that is uh, something where the whole uh, the world has to work on. A lot has been discussed about the debt trap. Um, I would like to mention two points here regarding the debt issue. I think since it is discussed uh, widely, um, but the, the Chinese government is also quite aware of it. And the Chinese government, in fact, has provided debt relief to countries which have been suffering from debt distress on a case-by-case -case manner. And uh, there are several examples how China has approached their issues in various countries. And according to um, International Monetary Fund, IMF, China was a creditor to 31 of the 36 HIPIC countries, HIPIC highly indebted poor countries. And it provided relief at least to uh, 28 of them, including 100% forgiveness for uh, several um, countries, uh, for example, in case of Burundi, Afghanistan, Guinea. So uh, I think there are also considerations regarding the debt issue. The, now bringing the debt issue, which is so you know heated uh, discussion when it comes to BRI, but one should not lose sight of the fact that uh, foreign aid or the official traditional official uh, development assistance. The effectiveness of foreign aid has always been uh, challenging and also a debated issue because we have studied uh, a lot on the effectiveness of aid or aid effectiveness and studies have shown that aid can be effective only in countries where, uh, where, is, uh, where, are, uh, the, the, where there are strong uh, institutions, where uh, there is good governance where there is um, uh, educated, you know, education, where there is less great tapism. So, which means that the domestic pre you know, condition has to be right for utilization of the aid. It is not only about the creditors or the donor, but also the, uh, the receiving, uh, receiving, uh, recipient country has to be also prepared through its uh, own preparedness, through uh, ensuring good governance, good management, less corruption, um, you know, institutional reform, strong institutions, 
accountability and transparency. Otherwise, if we, for in it never works. And that there are several studies on that. Now, same, you know, if you follow the same rule, of course, uh, let me also bring, um, uh, uh, highlight a few issues regarding the foreign aid. Because this is the domestic side, but also the, from the donor's aspect, there are also difficulties or problems. Uh, the problem of conditionality, aid conditionality has been traditionally, there has been aid conditionality, which was also dictating the terms of using the foreign aid in the recipient countries. The issue of predictability, because countries don't know whether when a project is being implemented by a support, whether that project will be continued after a year or not. So when there is a long-term project which needs to you know, be financed for a, for a number of years, if the project doesn't get a continuous flow or support, then the project cannot be implemented. So predictability has been a quite challenging on the part of the implementing countries. And then also tied, untied aid, uh, because you know, there have been a lot of similar to conditionality. And because of these, effective utilization of aid has been also difficult for the countries. And realizing that these challenges or these you know, um, issues which are not very conducive for uh, the implementing countries. As you remember that in 2005, there has been this declaration, Paris Declaration on effect, Aid Effectiveness. So this Paris uh, Declaration on Aid Effectiveness set uh, forth a number of issues to um, you know, facilitate the utilization of foreign aid in a better way. And after that, uh, you know, because and as I've mentioned that aid was not being you know, found to be very effective. So after that, now it is being monitored whether countries, the donor countries are following, how much donor countries are you know, aligning their own agenda with the recipient countries agenda, whether the, there is harmonization among the many, among many donors, because it has been also uh, experienced that uh, many donors are supporting or financing one single project, a pet project, so which is a sheer waste of money. So, the what I'm trying to say that the difficulties or the limitations of uh, aid has always been there. Now, why we are pointing out to this debt trap and all these is an issue to be discussed further. So, I I feel that this is in the same line. Now, the issue is that. Uh, uh, the, China is not the member of this Paris club. So if it is a member, then it would be better that you know, they can also follow these rules, you know, Paris principles on aid effectiveness that would be useful for both, uh, both China and also the recipient countries. So I would uh, end, there have been many questions. I think I, I'm not qualified for those. Provence, you have the floor. Uh, first of all, uh, I just, uh, without any, uh, uh, what would I say? I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, there are several issues over here that has been raised. One thing that we would uh, like to address, and that's been also raised by Ambassador who's there, uh, it's not about how low the interest rate is, remember, because it's also about the volume of loan that you take. Because once a country thinks that China is the lender of last resort, Often countries, host countries themselves feel emboldened to take on bigger and larger projects with greater risks. And as a result, what happens is internal insight or oversight capacity by the host country is conspicuously absent. So you take on more risk because you think, okay, if the Western countries do not bail me out on this, the Chinese are going to come in. And once the Chinese somehow give you that loan and then you are unable to pay it, because of internal fissures or because of mismanagement or malmanagement, then the questions of Chinese alleged debt trap will take place. And whether we say that debt trap exists or not, the actual fact is we don't have enough data. BRI needs to take place or projects at BRI needs to take place for another 10 to 20 years before we can say for certain. And that's the first point. Number two, let us not kid ourselves. Every country wants to propagate its self-interest. That is an essential fact. And what is, what is trade if you cannot translate into power? 
Same thing for United States of America, same thing for United Kingdom, same thing for Russia. Now, of course, China. China is as benevolent as the United States of America. I do not understand this. Oh, China is different. Why does China have to cringe over here? They want to extend the power and influence. Why this hand wringing? Nobody is over here. To, oh, we are the benefactors of the world. Nobody is a benefactor. Even our own governments are not benefactors. They are all motivated by own personal interests. That is the, and how we deal with BRI is what is our, what are just like you're getting a credit card. Do you have the ability to pay in the future? Do you have alternative assets? Are you asking for the right kind of loan? Please, it's not about the Chinese or the West. The Chinese are quite smart. They have retrenched, they have rescaled. They're now investing in the digital silk route as opposed to physical infrastructure where they know corruption is a big problem. Third issue, I hear a lot of issue, is the Chinese way of authoritarianism or Western democracy. This is a futile debate. It's an infantile debate. There is no perfect democracy. People who support Trump think that their elections have been, uh, their victory has been stolen. In China, there's broad elements of freedom in limited sense. Each country comes up with its own equilibrium. You cannot have this imposed from outside. It is an organic process. Whenever we see, and unfortunately we have had past experiences of this, where it's been forced from within and without, it has had disastrous results. Again, so the Chinese or the American model is not the one thing to do. Do we have stakeholder participation? Do we have broad-based consensus? And last but not the least, one question that was again posed by Aisha and Dr. Forrest Cookson, who isn't here, very interesting question. As we engage more with BRI, what are the potential repercussions? And as Dr. Forrest Cookson has quite astutely pointed out, that are we using our export earnings from uh, America to pay off Chinese debts? And what if they are stalled as repercussion or as retaliation for us moving closer into the BRI orbit? Now, that question remains to be seen because we, as many other countries, are engaged, as has been pointed out, even within G7 countries, Italy has signed on to BRI. But mind you, it's just an MOU. There has not been substantial projects that have been followed through, understandably so. Now, there's also this question of weaponization of human rights. We have seen Magnitsky Act being used. Now, but also, we must also realize there's no smoke without fire. So we have to manage our internal resources, our internal stakeholders wisely, so that again, no country gets the scope to interfere. So uh, with these limited issues, I will hand back the floor. Thank you. Prabhupada, thank you very much for your last comments. Uh, the discussion has been very rich. And it is not possible for either me or Zafar to summarize anything, except the fact that it is a mega project, a grand strategy that is evolving. And we will have to wait and see how it progresses. But needless to say that it will have deep impacts in most of our region and most of the countries of the world, including Bangladesh. One thing we have to remember that it is not a project or a concept that should clash with other issues. We should see it as a development effort. We should see it as a infrastructural support effort because there is a gross demand for infrastructure in most of the third world countries. But we have to be careful in handling the finances that comes with the projects. In Bangladesh, we are beginning to understand some of the connotations of BRI. And as we progress, we have to be extremely careful as to how we handle them. But no mega project of this size comes without geopolitical and geostrategic implications. And so is BRI. So therefore, we have to understand all the implications and connotations of geostrategy, geoeconomics, and increasingly now, geoenergy involved with BRI. And the newer concepts of digital Silk Route 
and the polar silk route has deeper implication for strategic footprint of BRI in other areas where BRI has not ventured before in the old silk route. So altogether, it's a challenging concept. It is a concept that brings in a lot of new ideas and prospects, and every country needs to handle them responsibly. With that thought, I hand it back to Zafar for his last comment before we end. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to our two panelists and all the participants here today. I think it is with some confidence that I, that I can say this has been the most wide-ranging and illuminating discussion on the Belt and Road Initiative that I certainly have had the pleasure of being involved in or read about uh, here in Bangladesh, and I so strongly suspect um, elsewhere as well. I think in conclusion, I just want to reiterate two points made by our panelists. The first uh, by um, uh, Professor Parvez, where he points out that all countries act in their self-interest. No one is um, operating uh, economic or uh, uh, political projects and initiatives such as these out of the goodness of their own heart, out of a sense of altruism. The idea is whether other countries, and here I'm speaking specifically about us here in Bangladesh, but this is true for all other countries involved, is to whether we can also take these initiatives and act in, in our own self-interest and whether there's a commonality of our self-interest. And that really is the um, is the perspective through which to view these projects at an individual national level. And I think Dr. Famida raises a very good point where she points out that for all of this discussion of debt trap, it's not so dissimilar to the discussion we had in Bangladesh starting in the 1980s about aid conditionality. You see, there are always um, strings attached when people um, lend money when people get involved in economic projects. And of course, it could be a good question to raise as to whether um, conditionality is better or worse than the so-called debt trap, which we are seeing with the Chinese product uh, um, um, projects. And in the end, of course, when you talk about a debt trap, what's really happening is the uh, transfer of um, debt um, investment into an equity investment. So I don't even know if a trap is necessarily a um, correct way of um, viewing the actual, uh, actually what's happening in those relationships. Anyway, much food for thought. I think uh, this has been a great discussion. I hope there'll be many more. And thank you all for giving us your time this afternoon.